LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Brendan Howland. Have you ever thought that there must be a better way to live your life? In his 2014 book, The Handbook of Urban Druidry, Modern Druidry for All, and its 2016 follow-up, The Urban Ovate, The Handbook of Psychological Druidry, Brendan Howland holds up a lens through which you and I, if we so choose, may reconsider the path that we are on. Distracted by rampant consumerism, browbeaten by scientific materialism, and fearful of a hostile world apparently plunging into chaos, a corrosive malaise is upon us in this still new millennium, our lives stripped of meaning and purpose by superficial societies which deny the significance of either. With this reverence for nature, deep ecological awareness, and belief in respect for all beings, the ancient spiritual order of Druidry offers a set of guiding principles which can be adopted and adapted by anyone, religious or otherwise, to help cope with the challenges of modern life and live in harmony with the natural world, reconnecting with wholeness and ultimately with ourselves. Hello and welcome Brandon and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Great to meet you again, Greg. Um, happy to be here, yeah? Thank you, Brendan. Okay, now today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ideas in your books, The Handbook of Urban Druidry, Modern Druidry for All, and uh, more recent, The Urban Ovate, The Handbook of Psychological Druidry. Before we get started on all that, just give listeners a little bit of a background about yourself personally and uh, your work in general. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm quite unusual in that I'm a, a full-time scientist. I teach chemistry at the university here at the University of Surrey and uh, normally people like me aren't interested in mysticism and spirituality but I came through a, a route where I got interested in the Kabbalah and self-help psychology while I was at university and I carried it on and drifted around and one thing led to another and Georgia kept appearing in things I read and I finally followed it up and did the course there, three courses, Bardo, Mate and Druid ended up becoming druid, and uh, then I became a tutor. So I've been tutoring bards and ovates for about 20 years now, yeah, which has been very valuable and very useful. And from all that experience, I thought, see, things kept coming up again and again with my tutees. And I thought, why don't I just put it all together in one simple volume and let people then read for themselves and find out what being a druid involves, because there is a kind of... Um, not much knowledge about what druidry is and what druids do. And uh, to be honest, a lot of the hairy pagan type druids tend to frighten people who are not hairy pagan. <laughs> so I thought there was a chance to get it over to the general public in a way. I should say that druids don't proselytise as such, yeah? So we don't actively recruit. If people want to join them, we do, yeah? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's, that's very important. And yeah, um, I think I've set out actually in my recorded introduction, I have set out basically, you know, basic uh, outline of Druidry for people who are completely new to it. But perhaps I could just get your take on, I know you say don't, you, you know, you don't, uh, proselytize in the way that, um, a lot of mainline religions do, but perhaps you could just set out how your perspective on Druidry, you know, what it is, what it means, particularly from a personal perspective for you, and then tell us a, a little bit more about your personal route into this, particularly coming from a scientific background. Yes, I mean, uh, the important thing, Druidry as I see it, is that we're a spiritual order, we're not a religion. And there are people who disagree with me on that because 
you may have seen that Juju has become the newest religion in the UK, but I don't see it as a religion because there's no concept of deity, so you can have whatever god or goddesses or whatever you like yourself, or not at all, there are secular druids as well. So we have Christian druids, Buddhist druids, pagan druids, and secular druids. So that's quite important, the fact that it's actually an order, yeah? And uh, I see it as something that can be carried on in your daily life to complement your religious practice. And really, I mean, the one thing that we can only ever really know about life is the fact that we are here. And the fact that we're here means that we ought to experience it. And that really is a nuts out of jewellery. We should experience the world we're in and take inspiration from it. And that's what I do in my jewellery and lots of other people that I know. So that's one of the reasons why I got attracted to it, because there's a, a beauty and majesty. You know, you watch a sunset. Nobody can fail to be moved by pretty a sunset or walking in the woods, yeah? And this is spirituality at its best, really. This is how we, we know we're alive. And that's what I really get out of it. The thing that occurs to me and may occur to many other people listening is, okay, so you're talking about a spiritual dimension there to life and to larger existence. But what what is it about druidry then? If, you, if it's not, not a religion, I understand that. Um, mm. So what is it that changes if you then decide to make a commitment to it to make this part of your life, what's the difference between someone who has got a spiritual dimension to their life uh, in some of the ways that a, a druid might identify with, and someone who actively calls himself, "I am a druid. I have under, you know, I'm on a path, or I have undertaken some kind of commitment. I've done something, albeit not religious." Yeah. What, what 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 actually changes when you you decide to 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 go yeah. down that path? Yeah, I see what you say. I mean, the important thing about druid is we share a common practice and not a common set of beliefs. And that's quite unusual because most revealed religions require you to share the same set of beliefs. So my colleagues who are Druids in Guildford, they would believe completely different things to me. That makes no difference because we follow what we call the Wheel of the Year. So eight times a year we meet and we have rituals that, which um, we share each together. And being Druid means that we do that. And uh, we meet in groups and we have meditations and we visit nice places and things. We go to Stonehenge twice a year. And we go for the, not the summer solstice because it's too crowded, but on the early June morning, two weeks before, you'll find us there at Stonehenge at five in the morning or so. And uh, we chant and uh, we share things. And there's this camaraderie, this being part of a, a thing that's bigger than you, which is very inspiring because everyone always says uh, how friendly and welcoming druids are and there's a real feeling of camaraderie in it so we're all different but we're all the same which is kind of a paradox but <laughs> that's how it works yeah well yeah i think that's one of the the main things that people who are religious in a more conventional sense speak about is this sense of some uh, being part of something that's bigger than them um, whether, you know, if they are part of a, uh, a conventional religious structure or even people who are spiritual but not, don't necessarily identify with any particular path, they say they have a sense of something that's bigger than them. And I think a lot of us do have this, even people who, who consider themselves to be non-religious and, uh, we, but we seek it and, and try and find it in different ways. And I think this is why one of the problems I think we've maybe run into in the modern world is maybe a denial that there is anything other than what's just the, the five senses can articulate or accommodate. This loss of a sense of unity or communion or the fact that the willingness to acknowledge there could be anything bigger um, has less, left us at a bit of a dead end, I find. I don't know, in your experience of Druidry, um, you, you spoke earlier of some of the diverse types of people that um, could be, be part of any given Druid order or just the wider Druidry itself, but I don't know what your personal experience is of, of the numbers of different types of people from different walks of society and other different races and religions and parts of the world that you've come across in your Druid travels. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a wide variety of people. I mean, in the book I talk about sweet little old ladies in tweed skirts and heavy pagans and things, yeah, but... Uh, the conventional people and non-conventional people, and I tutor people from literally all over the world. So we've got people in South Africa, 
New Zealand, uh, Holland, and Germany, North America, quite a lot of people in North America. They're all very different, all have different experiences, but we all share this common practice. And uh, as you said before, there's a spiritual malaise, a gap at the centre of civilization. That's kind of God-shaped hole in a way, you might call it, yeah? People feel that something is missing. All the sort of uh, buying goods, living your life the way you're supposed to live, isn't satisfying. And people are, are struggling and yearning for something more. And Druji gives us that in that way. And one more important thing is that when you meet Druids, Druids are actively trying to be good. I know that sounds trivial, but people are actually trying to help each other and be nice, yeah. And that is one of the key experiences that we have with Druids. People try and help each other and actively help each other and do things nice for each other, which you often don't get. You can get in normal life, you know, but a lot of people are so concerned about their jobs, their lives, their worries, they lose sight of the fact that, you know, we need to relate to each other and be good to each other. That's important. A lot, a lot of uh, religions of whatever type, whatever stripe, whatever colour, do profess to be like that, don't they? You know, um, it's like uh, helping your fellow man do unto others, etc., etc. Unfortunately, in, yeah. pra- in practice, it's quite often not like that. It doesn't play out in that fashion. Um, no, I think a lot of modern sort of a lot of revealed religions are about power and control. Yeah, and uh, in Druidry, the power and control is entirely up to you. You can do as much or as little as you like, and no one's going to tell you that you've got to follow these observances or not. And that's quite a freeing frame of mind to have when you're used to. When I grew up as a Catholic, and Catholicism is um, pretty much a medieval religion, and it's very, very structured and very, very about control, whereas Druidry is not. So you're quite right, yes. That is a good point, yeah. I think at the heart of all the uh, major religions... And many, if not most of the uh, significant spiritual traditions, is kind of a a central truth that u- unites them all, really. And I think that the, the sort of control and even corruption that that uh, uh, certain world religions f- have fallen into in recent centuries, or maybe even millennia, um, has has been a result of losing sight of that. You know that the the, the symbols and the rituals and the teachings kind of became blurred and misinterpreted and like a case of Chinese whispers down the centuries. And what we can often be left with today is kind of a hollowed out husk of uh, repetitious ritual and words and deeds and calendar events that uh, uh, speak to something. They're echoes of something very important that's kind of gone now. A lot, a lot of people are going through the motions and in that context, it seems to me that certainly with Druid practitioners that I've spoken to, that they seem to be somewhat more actively in touch with a, a thread that's been more intact down the ages with something from the past, something that was very important. And, and maybe because of the way it's been done, you know, it hasn't been formalized, it hasn't been organized, it hasn't been exported around the world like a commodity that it's been able to do this and maybe in that sense it's it's got uh, druidry has something in common with other indigenous spiritual traditions i'm not sure how, how you see that you're right about the uh, revealed religions but um if you look at the mystical part of the revealed religions all those are the same so mystical christianity sufism and islam western magic etc there's a core of beliefs that are basically the same as in druidry so the mystical part all religions are the same, but the mystical part, most people don't even get near because they just follow the, the practices that they're told to do, yeah? So when you go out on your own and embrace it, it's very common, yeah? And that true thread, probably as you say, goes back way into prehistory, yeah? Because people haven't changed from an evolutionary point of view. We've been here hardly any time at all on, on the earth, yeah? So there's been no real time for the human mind to evolve. So when you were from a Neanderthal type to now, the human mind is probably very, very similar. So there's been no change, yeah? And we all respond to the same things. That's true, yeah. Now, at the very early stages of one of your books, um, I think it might have been Urban Oviate, but it hardly matters. You posed the question, have you ever thought that there must be a better way to live 
than the way you do now. And yeah. this kind of, what a very good question. And I think probably a lot of people, if they're being honest, would say, well, yeah, even if they don't necessarily know that there is, they have thought about it, they have considered it. Because everybody's got some aspect of their lives that they want to improve or they that they realize must change, whatever it happens to be, whether they're subconsciously or otherwise. And um, that seems to be an increasing trend, as, as we alluded to earlier, in terms of like a spiritual malaise in yeah. modern society. And that's the kind of jumping off point that you adopt for um, looking at uh, all, all sorts of aspects of ourselves and how we see ourselves, how the world, the rest of the world, how we relate to others, how we conduct ourselves. And um, it's that's the, uh, how can I put it, that's the, the, the overall structure or that's the basic question that you use to explore some of these different aspects of life. And of course, particularly in, in the second book, you're talking about modern life because one thing that a lot of conventional religions seem to struggle to do is to appear relevant to, to so many of us uh, wrestling with the challenges of the 21st century. And a lot of it's kind of, as you say, you talked about Catholicism appearing medieval. A lot of these uh, traditional religious teachings don't appear to be able to speak to the issues that people are dealing with right now, particularly at this time, despite the fact that there are these common threads. I think mainline religions, having kind of lost the thread, as it were, lost the plot, um, are unable to to, to, to help people out. And I think that's uh, one of the ways that um, certainly, you know, having read both your books, I think that you're saying, look, this, this tradition that that I am part of, there is a framework here to, you know, to help us maybe get a bit of clarity. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're right. I mean, the people struggle with modern life. They struggle with modern life because they think you've got to have these amount of goods, this house, this car, 2.4 kids, 0.8 dog or so, to count yourself uh, a person who's achieved something. And to be honest, a lot of people don't achieve that sort of thing, and they feel failures, yeah? And a lot of work is pretty mundane these days, yeah? There's not um, much challenge in it. So people suffer and they want something more. And what I decided to do in the book is just to wake you up and say, look, you know, there is more to your life, and everybody can have it, You've just got to get out there and grasp it. But it's not so easy to do. In theory, it's easy to do. The truths are really, really simple. But to get to it is quite hard when you're caught in a rut in your your life. And you've got to basically take a chance to step out of yourself, look at what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then see if they're still appropriate. And this is the key to sort of druidry and the key to most magical practices because at some point you've got to basically question who you are, why you're doing things, what you're here for. And most people run and hide from that, yeah? So as you know yourself, yeah, mobile phones, people spend virtually their entire lives on mobile phones, yeah? And never stop to think what's going on in their own heads, yeah? And they do this noise, constant noise in society is there to stop you thinking, basically. Stop you thinking about what you're doing, where you're going, and what you should actually want to, out of your life. And that's, that's a big problem, yeah. So there are some quite simple ways to get back in touch with your life and slow down a bit and take some time. And interestingly, um, we have a, someone in the Druid grade who's a, actually an Anglican vicar. And he said he was drawn to Druidry because of the real spirituality and faith that he found amongst Druids, which he didn't find amongst the congregation, which just supports what you were saying earlier, yeah? The faith is there, but you've just got to tease it out these days. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah. One of the local churches here, part of the Church of England, one of the the canons here is actually espouses Zen philosophy mm-hmm. and uh, involves the congregation, you know, in a purely sort of uh, a co- come and find out what this is about sort of format. But um, I thought when I found out about that, I thought it was interesting because it shows us that kind of like what you might call interfaith, I suppose, overlap. And there's a lot of talk about that these days, you know, kind of a need for interfaith dialogue. But aside from all the formal aspect of that, where it's very much, you know, it's kind of political or very much really just like a peace summit of sorts. um, It's just interesting to see what can happen in an informal context 
when you've got these people who are part of other mainline religions, but they, you know, maybe they do have a Buddhist thing going on, or as you say, you know, they're part of Druidry in some respect. And, um, I can only really see that as positive because it, it's reminding us of, you know, beyond the, the mainstream of conferences where faiths get together to kind of discuss their commonalities and then they just go back to bickering the way they always do. It's mm. interesting to see what people can do just left to their own devices when they can get together and discover what they do actually have in common. And and again, we, we keep coming back to these things that we can all recognize. Okay, oh, so Druids see the world this way and dru- Druids espouse this. And well, that's funny because, you know, we do this and, uh, you know, we, we do have a lot more in common than meets the eye, but I think that the things that divide us, of course, as in all aspects of, of life and society, are the things that make the headlines. Yeah, that's quite interesting because um, a Druid colleague of mine here in Guildford is into interfaith, as you say, yeah, and he organised an interfaith walk, and we basically we started off with the Quakers, then we went to what was the site of a 12th century Jewish synagogue in Guildford, which now just has a plaque on the wall. And I walked past it for 20 years, never seen it until that night. Yeah. Then we went to Anglican Church and we went to Unitarian Church and we talked about the feelings of the environment. What was interesting was at the uh, Jewish synagogue site, they read from the Hebrew Bible. And in the Hebrew Bible where God gives, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, God gives Adam charge of the earth. He gives him guardianship of the earth. And that word guardianship is translated as dominion in the Western Bible, yeah? And that makes a big difference, yeah? So, we're actually only here to look after the earth, not to be in charge of it. So, there is a lot more commonality than people actually realise when you, you think about it. So, you're, you're quite right there, yeah? Well, it, yeah, it's funny you should touch upon the environmental consciousness aspect there, because that's something that all certainly all the main Abrahamic religions seem to, if not disregard, then certainly don't see as particularly important is our relationship to the rest of nature, of course, and we're seen as like set up somehow above nature, particularly, you know, that's my limited experience of the Christian tradition. And that's one of the reasons or one of the lines of thinking that's kind of put us in the position that we're in now in relation to, you know, we're, we're separate from nature. So whether we're afraid of nature or whether we see nature as a, a store cupboard for us to raid or whether we see it as a trash can for us to throw our spent materials into. And this disconnect has all sorts of like practical manifest downsides that we're increasingly having to deal with on an ongoing basis. Uh, but also our just the disconnect also robs us of um, a very important relationship we have of, you know, with the rest of our realm, as I say, which after all, we are inextricably linked with in every possible way and again my limited experience of talking to uh, druids has been emphasizing you know a, a reverence for nature because that's what's keeping us alive really at the end of the day and uh, that's what that we're part of and again i suppose that then also points to another overlap with um indigenous spiritual traditions which you know as i mentioned earlier tend to be to still reflect a tradition that has um survived relatively intact over a very long period of time and not been subject to the same stresses and corruptions that a lot of uh, mainstream religious traditions have. Yeah, you're right, because um, recently I've been finding articles in The Guardian, etc., on uh, the need for green space. I think I mentioned it in the book that in an urban environment you need green space to, basically for your health and well-being. So that's why we have parks and gardens in cities. And uh, in Japan, they actually recommend that people get out into green space and enjoy it. That's actually actively encouraged. And uh, you're right, I mean, as the environmental movement has grown, people have realised that we're basically killing off thousands of species, and this just cannot continue. Yeah? We, I mean, the bees is a prime example. We kill off the bees, we all die because there's nothing to pollinate our crops, yeah? So we starve to death. And people have actually realised that there's a, a desperate link there that we need to preserve. Some trees um, will take carbon dioxide out of the air. You get rid of them, you get carbon dioxide levels to rise. Yeah? So the whole thing is a balanced and an ecosystem that we have a role in, that we do not own and we do not dominate. And as you say, as you go back to the earlier ways of life, 
this was well understood. I think in Bill Bryson's book, uh, America, he talks about how they came out into the interior of America and discovered basically a parkland that was farmed for the buffalo by the Native Americans. Yeah. So they understood this environmental balance. You couldn't take too much and you couldn't uh, destroy too much and you had to look after it and care for it. And people, strange enough, are only just really realising that again, which, as you say, is tragic, isn't it? I mean, we've had civilizations that have risen up to become great in ways that perhaps not on a scale with modern industrial civilization, but certainly with certain uh, tenets and characteristics that we could recognize, you know, whether it was ancient Egypt or Rome, Greece, you know, things that we can say, oh, like, there's an arc there to the rise and fall of that civilization that we that we can recognize, you know, the building, the scale of everything, development, uh, moving out throughout concentric circles outwards, you know, colonizing and uh, using resources. Oh, that given, I think for the most of human history, as far as we can understand, there has been by necessity more of a balance, a living in balance with the natural environment, with what's around us and not being able to take too much because the feedbacks could be really quite savage and very immediate. If you did too much, you could end up with a field harvest. It could be wiped out. And so you'd learn pretty quickly what you could do and what you couldn't do within certain limits. And I think it's only relative, relatively recently since the advent of the Industrial Revolution and the widespread exploitation of fossil fuels that we as a species have been able to enormously overshoot the carrying capacity um, of many parts of the natural environment to the point where you know we're now reaping what we sow in that sense you know we're, we're, we're huge problems are coming back to bite as huge uh, increasing shortages um, all sorts of problems uh, but still population continues to increase because the I think the fossil fuel surplus that we enjoyed for so long is we're, we're still carrying a lot of momentum from that and I think that at some point I don't know how long it'll take um, I've done a lot of interviews with uh, a druid from North America called John Michael Greer and mm -hmm. he's written a lot of books on this topic but at some point 100 years 200 years maybe longer we're gonna hit uh, start to hit buffers and we're going to have to take a step back along the lines that you and I have been pointing towards to a more balanced way of relating to the natural environment. You know, we can't carry on in this trajectory. There's no such thing as endless growth. Whether we'll set off on the same kind of crazy arc again of growth in the future remains to be seen. Who knows what technology will bring? But I think this could be the, perhaps the biggest spurt of growth that humanity has ever seen, what we're part of now. And it could be maybe the hardest reset as we were, we take two steps forward and one step back into something that looks a little bit more like balance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I sit here in my house and I look out over the weald between the North Downs and the South Downs in England. And that area there has probably the biggest untapped oil reserve in the UK. And the government wants to exploit it, obviously, yeah? And uh, it's fracking, basically, is the way to get it, yeah? Because there's lots of shale, gas and oil in there because... It used to be basically a swamp where dinosaurs roamed <laughs> in the Cretaceous era. There's lots of um, plants and things which are rotted and produce oil. But um, we don't know if the um, shale deposits in the UK run in a straight line like they do in America. So you may have to put loads and loads of wells in to get the oil out, which is just going to devastate the landscape. And we were invited as druids to... Uh, an exploratory well site in Leaf Hill in Surrey to do a blessing of the land and the local people asked us to come because they felt that this was going to make a big difference to their lifestyle and it will do, yeah? And of course, this desperate search for oil, as you say, is really unnecessary because there is technology that we can use where we don't need it. We can clearly easily move to the electrical base society and if we lose renewable energy, you could generate all the energy you need. But, of course, as you say, the uh, big business and government is still bound up in the oil industry, and they won't move from that. But they will have to, because even if they do manage to exploit places like the wheel, the oil will run out. We've basically burned an entire era, <laughs> where the carbonaceous era, where plants and grew all over the earth 
who filmed the whole lot virtually in the several hundred years. And that's appalling, isn't it? Absolutely appalling. So yep, yeah, get back to a more environmentally based uh, future. And Druidry in a way has grown out of that because I think one common thing most Druids share is an environmental awareness and a belief that we've gone far enough in uh, raping of the earth and it's time to step back and find another way. So yeah, I'll agree. What field of science are you involved in actually? At the moment I'm working in the a thing called supercapacitors, which um, you may or may not have heard of. Batteries charge quickly, charge slowly and discharge slowly, but supercapacitors charge quickly and discharge quickly. So you can get a lot of energy very quickly from them. And they're an alternative to batteries, and we're developing them to have the same output as batteries, and that will be a transformative effect on transport and electric grids and so forth and so on so it's quite an exciting time i ask because obviously you've got a not a unique perspective there but an interesting perspective at working in science and uh your spiritual path because a lot of people uh who might hear you right talking about these challenges facing um humanity will always point or are very quick to point to technology as kind of the panacea you know, they, quote unquote, whoever they are, will think of something and whether it's, uh, you know, renewable energy or some kind of miracle breakthrough, cold fusion, there's all sorts of things out there if you go and look uh, yeah. that have been held up as the answer to the fossil fuels dilemma. Uh, nothing I have seen has convinced me that we can, for the future, carry on with the scale of energy consumption that we have now and particularly not to grow it which, of course, is what our economic model demands, you know, not just with an increasing population, but with uh, a world population that wants to increasingly industrialize. If I was putting my money anywhere, it would be on uh, betting on the fact that we cannot do that in the foreseeable future. So however things pan out, we're looking at downsizing, downscaling, pulling back, it, you know, whatever... Uh, promising advances might come, for example, from you know the work that you're involved in. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the seventies where I grew up, there were lots of science fiction stories, which were basically flagging out the fact that we were going to have an overpopulated world and there wouldn't be enough resources to go around. And people tend to ignore that now. That seems to have gone out of people's consciousness. And population is growing at an astounding rate. And we're just one part of the species of life on this planet. So it's our duty really to keep ourselves in balance like everything else. And uh, so I agree entirely. We've got to look at our, get a good look at ourselves and find a different way of doing things. Well, I think one of the things that might have happened, um, you mentioned the 1970s and a lot of those sci-fi stories. And of course, that was the, there was the oil crisis back then. And there were some people talking in very concrete ways, if you'll pardon the pun, about uh, renewable energy and uh, solar panels on every roof and what have you. And then, of course, that all went away with the advent of Reagan and Thatcher in the 1980s. But I think some of the doom-mongering in the 70s kind of overstated things. And I'm not talking now about science fiction, which mm. kind of, of course, can go anywhere, but there were certainly some books written and some lectures given and some people out there who were prophesy prophesying doom you know the year 2000 you know the earth would be a wasteland and because things didn't pan out that way that quickly i think it was very easy then particularly in the 1980s for people then to say oh that was all just nonsense you know there's a new techno dawn uh bright future and they could go back to almost the attitude that existed in the 1950s you know if we'll all be going on day trips to the moon soon and uh you know we'll all have um electric cars will be flying through the air you know etc etc absolutely yeah that's a total attitude, because as you said earlier, anyone who believes in infinite growth in a finite world is either an idiot or an economist. <laughs> and <laughs> that's what's happened, obviously. They've got the range, haven't they? Yeah? They tell us what we should believe. Yeah. I think um, yeah. to move on to another aspect yeah. here, um, we're very much talking about what's going on outside of us, whether it's our relationship with um, the natural world and the environment or relationship to our own technology and, you know, the man-made environment and where that's heading on all those fronts. But, of course, we're talking 
in general here about uh, druidry as you know it's a spiritual path and that then is about the inner life and about our own minds and ourselves and working on that developing that and becoming within that and i think that's something that i think there's a, a huge appetite for right now and increasingly so uh, you only have to look at the number of self health self help books that sell and how many websites and how many gurus there are out there talking about paths to inner peace peace and self-realization and uh, manifestation and on and on and on every bookshop now has got a mind body and spirit section that certainly wasn't the case in decades gone by so there is an appetite for something more than just the material there's no question about that i think people are waking up to the fact that um matter isn't all that matters and that shopping isn't just satisfying them anymore if it ever really did well yes i mean the order that i'm in the order of bars of eights and druids we're the largest trade order in the world yeah and that's about fifteen thousand people now which is isn't a large number globally, yeah? But for a Druid organisation, that's quite big. And when people come into Druidry and start doing these practices, a lot of people have said to me over the years, they feel like they've come home. And that's a common experience, yeah? So you realise that this is where you want to be. And self-help and everything, yes, there's a load of uh, books and writings about it, yeah? But the big problem is actually doing it and I've seen books in several hundred pages with lots of exercises and so forth which people aren't ever going to read and are never going to get far down the road from so um, the idea of my approach is that do little things find time, find five minutes a day to just pause look at the world, reflect perhaps try a bit of meditation, because people are confused about meditation. You see pictures of people meditating for hours on end, yeah? And that's not a good thing, unless you were experienced, because meditation, in this tradition, brings up your stuff, and you have to deal with it, yeah? And it, so, I think Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a, a Korean monk, he says that meditation makes people crazy, and meditation makes them even crazy, crazier, so... Five minutes a day is enough to start with, just to calm yourself down, get yourself back in touch, and move on. So self-help is possible, but do it slowly, do it in a guided way, take it easy, and enjoy it. And the important thing is to enjoy it, and become happier, and more focused in what you do. And it doesn't take much, but you do have to keep at it. So the idea of writing the book is that you can read it in a couple of hours, and then you can refer back to it. There aren't lots of examples and case studies and things. There's just the basic facts there. And interestingly, a colleague of mine who um, is a druid, and he works in, he's a policeman in the Royal Parks in London, and he carries it around in his backpack so that he can refer to it from time to time. So he's actively following the path and referring to the book when he sees things and he has a moment or so, which is a good way to do it. So the movement, as you say, is growing and growing constantly and growing in ways we had, couldn't imagine when it started. And lots of people are getting benefit from it. And that's the important thing, to get benefit. Because if you're not getting benefit from something, don't do it. It's not worth it. Yeah, yeah I think there's a lot of that. Mm. Um, I've spoken to many people who've uh, reached a point in their lives when they're looking for something more, something else than what they're doing and what they've got and where they're going. And they're, they seek out some of the information that, that we've touched upon, some of the ideas that are out there, and they find themselves in that place, in that bookshop, loaded up with um, the latest hot titles from Hay House or whatever. And they go to endless workshops, and it's, I'd sum up the refrain that comes back when they feel that they're not getting anywhere, which is like, I know the theory. I, I understand this. I get this on an intellectual level, but how do I actualize this in my life? And yeah. I think that's very important because you you can you can go through the motions and you can you can uh, intellectually come to terms with all the ideas you want, but it's putting it into practice is very different. And an analogy for religious people would be someone who goes to church every Sunday and uh, then during the week they they treat their workmates like crap. Yeah, and you touched on something that I call 
smorgasbord spirituality where people do this course and then another course and they think, oh, if I do this course, then I'll find the secrets and I'll be there. But, you know, they're just wasting their time. One course is enough because, uh, as we said earlier, the basic tenets of spirituality are very simple and they're all the same. But you do actually have to do it. So, And the only one who can actually do it is you. We aren't really used to taking command of our own lives and command of what we do. So you've got to do it in small bite-sized pieces, take back ownership of your life slowly and enjoy what you're doing and then you can expand yourself. So you're absolutely right there. It's, it's, it's quite important to not run around like a headless chicken and try to find the next big thing. It doesn't work like that at all. Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's always that feeling that it's just around the corner, <laughs> whereas the, the truth is that you, you're, you're already there. It's yeah, just... you're there. You know what to do already. You just got to do it. <laughs> so, in in that in that spirit, then, um, perhaps we could just walk through a little kind of point by point thing that you have in one of the books, and it is about coming to terms with some of these aspects about your life and yourself that will help you see it with more clarity. And because you stress, um, you know, know thyself, which again is something a lot of people run away from because you know, the, as you mentioned about meditation, your stuff comes up. A lot of people are very uneasy with that. A lot of people are very uneasy about sitting in a dentist's waiting room without the radio being on. Well, that's right. You know, yeah. because they get, they get, um, shifty, you know, and they get restless and they want to be doing something. But you walk through a little point by point checklist that we can do to begin to explore our, ourselves, our lives, our backgrounds, our inner selves, you know, our ideas that we may have, our subconscious thoughts about things as a way of exploring paths forward and th- and how we might develop and uh, so we'll maybe mention a few of those key points and you can just explain to people uh, uh, examples i'm talking about here are coming to understand your own culture you know where you come from in that sense uh yeah. your, your genetic inheritance you know who, who are the people who came before you you know the ancestors um mm-hmm. our prejudices that we bring to the world and and there, there are others but the, start us down a little discussion of those aspects and explain why these things are important for people to explore Yes, I mean, um, this is basically what we do in the Ovate course, and it's the hardest bit. That's why I thought it runs a separate book. It's the hardest bit because it involves looking at yourself and finding out why you do things and where they come from. As you say, the first thing I touched on was your culture. This is the culture you've grown in, up in, uh, what you accept as normal, yeah? And in my case, it was an Irish Catholic culture, and you just got to look at yourself and say, okay, you know, I need to go to church because I'm a Catholic. Is that something I need to do now? Um, the Irish are very sociable. The And uh, because I've done this over the years and had loads of duties go through it, a major tenet of our course is that it's all secret and private, so we don't discuss people's cases with anyone yet. So I use myself as an example, yeah. So you've got to become aware first that of the culture that you live in and whether it's appropriate to you now, yeah? And you've got to think, sit down and think about it. And when you start thinking about the culture, you inevitably come to your genetic inheritance. And this is quite an interesting area in science. It's expanding a lot these days, yeah? And uh, you may have heard of the Seven Daughters of Eve, or you may not, yeah? And this bases a theory that all the people in Europe descended from just seven women. So, and most people in Europe, 40% of them from just one, which is astonishing when you think about it. So we're all brothers and sisters under the skin, yet there's only a small number of people. I read recently in the paper that if you go back 60 generations, that's the start of human existence, yeah? So we haven't been here a long time at all, really, yeah? So think about your genetic inheritance. Um... One of my duties was saying to me recently that um, he had a DNA test done, and you can, you probably have heard that most people in Europe have about four percent Neanderthal genes, yeah, because we we didn't wipe them out, we interbred with them. But it turns out that people in Holland average eleven percent Neanderthal genes, so there's more Neanderthal heritage in Holland, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's 
how it is, yeah. Maybe that's why they're so, maybe that's why they're so tall. <laughs> well, that's exactly what a Dutch guy I spoke to said. Yeah, that must be it. Yeah, so it could well be it. Yeah, so that could be part of the heritage, and that's a good thing. Yeah, so you've got to be aware of these things. Yeah, and uh, I looked at the the sequence of the Irish genome, and we found out that Irish people tend to have a a propensity for liver disease, but it doesn't mean you're going to get it. Yeah, it just means that there's a propensity there which you need to be aware of and take care of. So there are things lurking in your genome that you need to think about. And when there's the environment that you live in locally, it provides pressures and expectations on you. And you need to be aware of what those are too. Yeah? And expectations are key in your life because a lot of people have children because it's expected of them. Their parents and grandparents want children as they had children themselves. And there's enormous pressure on women to have children. And if that's okay for you, that's fine. If not, then it's not for you. But you need to make a conscious decision on that. Become aware of that. And then the last bit I talked about was where you are in history, because your historical time period forces you to do things and gives you expectations and beliefs that you also may not be aware of. We've come a long way from, say, uh, early times when slave trade was accepted, nobody thought it was normal, to now when people would think that was a poem. So there's a change in history that people are aware of now. Yeah? So if you go through these things, find out the things that actually move you and are giving you expectations, and then you just have to decide whether you still want to do them or whether you want to do something else. And you can free yourself that way. This is quite a common practice in spiritual traditions and uh, uh, in fellow in chaos magic, what they do is they basically break you down completely, get rid of all the expectations, and then build you back up again from those little fragments. Uh, in Druidry, it's much more subtle and gentle and doesn't require such drastic changes, yeah? but you can do it slowly and get a lot of benefit from it. You used the phrase that uh, the spirit of the age um, yeah. in the book um, yeah. and that intrigued me because I'd seen it written more than once in, in, in quite different contexts so uh, what, what, what were you referring to by that? This is how the expectations of the age that you're in, the historical context influences your behaviour if you were a medieval peasant your belief in the world would be a lot different from being a civilised urban height in this post-industrial age yeah? And people don't realise that there are pressures and expectations put on you by that. And in Druid we call these spirits, spirits of the age and spirit of place and spirit of that. And I tried to avoid that, but I must have slipped it in once. Yeah. But it is true. There is a spirit of the age in that it influences what you, how you behave. Yeah. I was interested to read about the uh, just the fact that you had this this Irish Catholic background. Yeah. When you were talking about the Irish culture, uh, of course, I'm intimately familiar with it. But about I can hear it in your voice. Yeah. Well, yeah, but uh, not being cath, not being from a yeah. Catholic background, half of it was happy to just sign up for the yeah. other half, which I recognised, of course. But I said, "That's not me. That's yeah. not me." I mean, for example, the you know propensity for fighting, and I know it's yeah. the most dreadful cliche in the world. I mean, yeah. I was really watching yeah. some cartoon a couple of weeks ago, and there was like Irish guys brawling in a bar, you know, a couple of yeah. drinks, and they were punching each other's lights. So that doesn't happen just like that yeah. automatically. But it cliches are cliches for a reason, aren't they? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. So I was just interested to read your your summation of it, and and my me rejecting out ha- out of hand half of it as saying I get that, but that's not me. But then I thought, well, maybe some of that is uh, Catholic influenced. You know, maybe some of the the guilt and some of the repression that manifests in different ways. Maybe it comes from that. Yes, it probably does. Yeah, because uh, there's a lot of guilt in Catholicism. The concept of sin is quite prevalent in Catholicism, which Protestants don't have. Yeah, mm-hmm. because um, you can be forgiven anything in Protestantism as long as you're truly sorry. Yeah, and the concept of being truly sorry is something that Catholics really don't have. Yeah. We get a confession and say, yeah, yeah, I've done that, yeah. Say a few Hail Marys and forget about it, but it doesn't go away. The Protestant way is better. You do have to actually acknowledge what you've done and find contrition from it, otherwise you cannot move forward. Mm. So you're right, yeah. But 
the fact that you've actually looked at it, said yes, no, means you've done the work, yeah? Okay, so we were just talking about these various aspects of our lives and beliefs and subconscious things that we bring to the um, how we act in the world and how we think of ourselves and other people that we may not really be aware of. And as you've just pointed out, it's not about wholesale rejection of things per se, but it's becoming aware of why we do what we do and what we can learn from that. And I think that, that we're very much, the, the lives that we live these days, we're very much um, discouraged from doing that, you know, actively or passively. It's kind of like sometimes actively because it suits governments, it suits businesses, it suits people who want to kind of manipulate us for whatever end. Uh, or passively, because just in general, that's the direction of travel. And um, I think that, as mentioned several times throughout the talk here, we're kind of being shaken out of that now by necessity, but also desire. And I think that a lot of the things that we do are done by what, what the writer Colin Wilson identified as the robot, which an aspect of ourselves, which we do need to live in the, the modern world that we have made, doing repetitious things, doing the school run, going to work, filling in forms, just so many aspects of our daily lives. But we've allowed that to do too much. And so our active engagement with our lives and ourselves and the world around us has really atrophied. I think that's really that's really where life happens, actually. And as necessary as the robot is, you know, whether we like it or not, that's going to be taken away from us and we're going to have to find a different way of being or perhaps rediscover a way of being is a better way to put it. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Because um, when I started doing the Druid course many years ago, I was talking to my wife about things that had upset me in the past. And she said, you know, you speak about them with exactly the same passion as you probably had when they happened to you. So you haven't processed these at all, yeah? They're just there in your memory, yeah? And you haven't come to terms with it. And you're absolutely right. There's lots of things in our lives that as we're in the robot run it, there are things that happen that upset us, that deeply hurt us, and we just don't process. And you carry on those through your life and they build up and they build up. And Georgie gives you a chance to sit back and say, okay, yes, that upset me, but it's over, it's done now. Let me feel that pain and accept it and then move on. And you absolutely right that most people don't do this. Women are slightly better at it than men, but uh, a lot of urbanites aren't very good at it at all. And you need to do that because there is a theory that you eventually die when you've got too much information stored that you haven't processed and it takes you away. So if you can go through and process these things and come to terms with them, you can actually live longer as well, which is encouraging, isn't it? I mentioned Colin Wilson a moment ago. I mean, I read in one of his books the idea that uh, is it possible that we die simply because we're too lazy to make a life worth living? <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's entirely possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of people do that. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah and this, that's why we have the the common occurrence of the, the you know the deathbed revelation you know whether it's a, a spiritual insight or whether it's just the revelation that um i wish i'd spent more time with my family you know or spent yeah. more time doing the things that i that i really love yeah, no it never says in the deathbed i wish i'd done more work do they never <laughs> no exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. and it and it always yeah. feels like that what i mentioned earlier about you know the spiritual seeking that's uh mm become so common once again, albeit still being done in a commercialized context that that's always just around the corner, you know, one more book, one more course. And the old cliche of tomorrow never comes is, is, is very true. And it's, you have to, all there is is right now. So right this moment is the minute to make a change if that's what you feel that you want to do. And mm -hmm. I see that can be something as simple as five minutes time for yourself during the day, just to not think about everything that's that occupies all your other time it can be maybe analyzing some aspects of your life along the lines that we just spoke about personal responsibility along those lines can be very very challenging but ultimately very rewarding yeah. and i think that's the that's always been the case though hasn't it you know the sort of uh, that if you take 
control. Uh, if you, I don't take control of your destiny, then you, you get control of it. You know what you put in, you get out. You know you get what you give. And so I think, stress, stress is caused by lack of control. Yes. Simply, yeah? Yes, absolutely. So if you take back control, you reduce the stress. You may not get rid of it entirely, but you reduce it. So if you're in control, there is no stress. And if you're in the present, there is no stress. But that's one of the hardest things of all to do, as you said, yeah? Because if you can live in the present all the time, you're in a stress-free environment. But you're always looking to the future, looking to the back, yeah? And if you try for one day, just try to stay in the present, you'll see really how difficult it is. And a lot of other spiritual traditions, um, certainly Buddhist ones, they ring a bell every hour or so to bring people back to the present because they know you've drifted off, yeah? Yes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and one one rejoinder I sometimes hear when talking about changing the path that we're on is along the lines of that's all right for X, that's all right for Y, but I'm not sure it's for me. It can, basically it, the the message is it, well, it can't be for everyone. Everyone can't do this. As if making these sorts of changes um, is somehow an elitist thing, or that you need um, a lot of spare time or money or knowledge or something to do this. I find that the op- opposite to be true is actually that the more of us that change the way that we see ourselves in the world, then the easier it becomes for everyone else who might like to. It's not a case of, uh, oh, well, there's a, there's a limited supply of this and then we'll pull up the ladder. Well, you're right. You, you can't change the world. You only change yourself. As you say, by changing yourself, uh, when everybody else changes then the world changes, but it's a process you have to do yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is why I think that a lot of people who are um, who are on a bit of a mission themselves are, you know, trying to sort of wake people up, quote unquote. And that, that reminds me of what you said actually at the start of the interview about Druidry. You know, Druid's not prophesizing like uh, other religions. It's not about going round door to door with leaflets um, because that, that wouldn't work in any event. No, absolutely, yeah. It's up to you, but you have the power then, which is the key message, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, just on that, again, we're just moving towards the final several points here. How would you characterize the difference then between speaking about how you see the world and how you feel and how you think and what you believe, you know, along the line, say, someone like yourself might do? And obviously, that's not the same as someone going door to door with leaflets or standing in a soapbox in a park. But if someone says to you, oh, well, what's the difference? You know, you're, you're here talking about it. Thousands of people are listening to this. They're hearing you speak about these ideas. What's the difference between that and someone preaching a sermon? Yeah, I mean, basically, that's a good point. But um, we try and live by example, yeah? So we don't make a big show of it. We just are, yeah? And if people see and think, oh, actually, they're quite nice people. Maybe I should be like them, yeah? But... um. As you say, I have written a book, I have written two books, yeah. But the point is to get the message out to a wider public. Whether they do it or not is entirely up to them. I'd rather they would, yeah, and take a, their life in their own hands. But I feel it's necessary that this message gets out rather than it has so far, yeah. Well, I suppose a final thought for myself is, again, addressing... Uh, um, an objection that I sometimes come across when talking about some of these ideas is that if we're facing great challenges in our society and for our species that some of the solutions or some of the ideas maybe about how to change things for the better or move things on or evolve them mean going backwards which you can I can see why some people might think that they might say that but from my perspective and I'll get yours in a second that's not how I feel at all. I think all we can do is go forward. That's that's what evolution is about. But what going forward looks like isn't the same necessarily in each age. Ideas of progress change. And I think we've just lived through one particular conception of progress, which is applied to a lot of, but by no means not all of the humans on the planet, and indeed the planet itself. So... Let's be flexible and let's be intelligent about what progress means and that going forward may not be quite what we thought it was 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And that really it's uh, about where we are inside 
that's the thing that's always there. The external circumstances, uh, you know, the things and stuff, that's, well, that's subject to change, you know, and we've seen from past history is that those things can bring us some kind of temporary uh, fulfillment, you know, and transient joy, but it's not the things and stuff really that uh, count in the long term. They're, they're not the things that are really the the great markers in the history of, of the world. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, when my mother was a child, there were no cars. They went everywhere in Ireland by pony and trap, yeah? There were no airplanes, yeah? Uh, international travel was unheard of, yeah? People went by a boat and things, yeah? And so the world we live in now is unconceivable, inconceivable to her as a child, yeah? And probably the world in 50 years' time be inconceivable to us now, yeah? So there will be changes all around it, but these changes and stuff, as you say, are only window dressing. What actually happens is what happens to you. And if you can be happier in your life, live a more happy, fulfilled life, and do some good, then you've, you've achieved something, yeah? Exactly. And in my experience, the thing that ultimately is most important to us when all said and done is actually other people. Even the misanthropists and the nihilists amongst us, um, you know, that's one way of seeing, seeing the world. But for most people, it's other people when everything else is taken away or even when you're laden with baubles and trinkets that doesn't, without other people, that's the relationships that we have, our friends or family, that those are the things actually that count and those are the things that, that are actually eternal yep absolutely yeah the people are what matter yeah as you say they can make your greatest joys and your greatest sadness in life yeah but at least you know you're alive then don't you and you interact with other people and that's that's going to be how things go yeah okay so today brendan we've been talking about some of the ideas in your books the handbook of urban druidry modern druidry for all and the urban ovit the Handbook of Psychological Druidry. I mean, those are widely available, Amazon, all the usual outlets. So just tell people anything you want to about those, or is there a website you'd like to share, or is it just anything you'd like to put out there? Yes, I mean, as you say, the book's available at most um, outlets. There is a website, there's a, a Facebook page called the Handbook of Urban Druidry, which people have kindly signed up to and liked, which are, and you can always contact me there through email if you like people have spoken to me about it before one person to point out a mistake I made but there's always mistakes in every book that's fair enough yeah. and uh, yeah so the information is there and uh, do embrace it and uh, let me know what you think and who knows I might see you at a druid meeting sometime in the future and I'll be happy to Splendid, well Brendan thank you once again for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com Thank you, very nice talking to you